Namaste. Today we will go through the second leg of revision session. So, we looked at LIDAR which stands for uh, light detection and ranging. So, it is we looked uh, when we discussed it we found out that it is an active remote sensing technique uh, that is also known as airborne laser scanning or ALS. So, it is a combination of laser plus radar. So, it, it uses a laser light in the same way that a radar uses radio signals. We used laser because it is monochromatic and it is directional. We looked at its concept. So, we need to know the exact position of the aircraft using differential GPS and the initial measurement units and then we get distance to the surface as we did in the case of a range finder. So, D is equal to C into T by 2 and by keeping track of angles we can get a 3D scan. So, there are 4 components of a lidar we have laser, scanner and optics, photo detector and receiver electronics and the position and navigational systems. So, these can be used on a satellite or these can be used on a helicopter or these can be used on the ground. Then we looked at different scanning mechanisms. So, we can have a, an oscillating mirror, a rotating polygon or a nutating mirror which will give us different kinds of ground patterns. There are two families of lidar. So, they go by the name of uh, waveform lidar and discrete lidar. We also looked at the wavelengths that are deployed that can also lead to a classification of lidar into topographic lidar that uses a near infrared laser or a bathymetric lidar that uses water penetrating green light to measure the sea floor and the riverbed elevations. So, what is the use of lidar in forestry? So, in the case of forestry we need to know uh, information about the canopy cover. So, in the case of lidar we can get uh, this uh, digital elevation model of the land, we can get the canopies. So, we can even get canopy structure. So, in the form of cross sections at uh, different sections at different points or different heights, we can get the height of the tree, we can get the leaf area density using lidar, we can uh, digitally calculate the canopy height of all different trees, we can compute all these information together to get carbon stocks. So, this figure tells us how much kg of carbon is there in each of these trees. We can also use a, a lidar horizontally. So, we can also get carbon stocks in horizontally. We can use it to study the plant growth and shape change and also the growth of forest. So, whether it is a young crop, a mature crop, an old crop or a mixed of these. Next, we looked at canopy attributes. So, uh, in the case of uh, uh, canopy, they are very important because uh, the size of a canopy will give you uh, the amount of photosynthesis that is going on in a tree and it also is important in the case of uh, nutrient cycling and so on. So, uh, species diversity, nutrient availability, biodiversity. So, for instance, orchids and are, are epiphytic plants that grow on top of trees. So, they require canopy. There are some arthropods, there are some mammals such as this sloth. So, sloth only lives in the canopies. And then canopy also is important for the retention of carbon. So, we looked at canopy parameters like canopy diameter and the canopy length or the crown length. This can be used to calculate the canopy volume and biomass. Then we also looked at uh, the canopy cover and canopy closure. So, we can define canopy layers. We can find out the structure of the canopy. So, uh, this can uh, tell us whether, uh, whether the forest is healthy or whether it is a sparse forest or it is a heavy defoliated forest uh, and we can even use lidar to study the canopy. Now, in the case of canopy we also looked at uh, how do we look at a canopy. So, we stand so half to one tree length away and then if there are two observers then they should stand at 90 degrees to each other. We looked at vigor class. So, what do we mean by, by vigor class? It is a visual assessment of the crown vigor of saplings. With this we defined three kinds of vigor classes. So, class 1 was uh, the most vigor class. So, in this case saplings must have an, an uncompacted live crown ratio of at least 35 percent and less than 5 percent dieback and 80 percent or more of the trees present must be undamaged. So, in this case the saplings will have a vigorous growth. Then we also defined a poor vigor in which less than 20 percent of the trees of the leaves are undamaged 
that is more than 80 percent of the leaves are damaged that does not fall in the first or the third vigor class is called a uh, moderate vigor class or class 2. Then we also looked at the uncompacted crown ratio. So, to uh, find out the uncompacted crown ratio we first established the live crown top then we determine the base of the live crown. So, with both of these we can find out the, the crown length then we can find out the height of the, the tree as we have already seen and then we can calculate the ratio. Then we also looked at crown light exposure. So, that is an estimate of the amount of direct sunlight that reaches the live ground when the sun is directly overhead. So, in this case we defined units of 0 to 5. So, we looked at our canopy in the form of cones and we divided it into uh, 4 sections horizontally and one section that covers the, uh, the top portion. So, if any of the horizontal sections receives 100 percent light only then it is counted. If it is uh, receiving partial light or no light then it is not counted and if in the case of the this top portion if any part of it is receiving light then it will be counted. So, it gives us an estimate of the amount of direct sunlight to which the tree is exposed. So, that will give, you, give us the amount of uh, photosynthesis that it will undergo and the amount of competition and the stand structure that our forests have. Next we looked at crown position which establishes the location of an individual live crown in relation to the surrounding over canopy. So, here we defined four codes that is super story, over story, under story and the open growth crown. So, in this case we first go for the average height which will give us an over story zone then we find out 50 percent of that height and that can be used to classify our trees into 1, 2 or 3 and in cases when our trees are grown very separate from each other and there is no competition there is an open canopy then we give it a code of 4. Next we looked at some other canopy attributes including crown density. So, crown density is the proportion of crown volume that contains biomass including foliage, branches and reproductive structures. So, we saw that we can uh, figure out its uh, crown density by using uh, by first uh, making out uh, the shape of the canopy and then using some cards. So, these are the foliage transparency scale cards or the crown density scale cards. So, it gives us the percentage of crown volume that gives that contains biomass. Next we looked at crown dieback. So, which is an early indication of stress and we uh, record it in 5 percent classes from 0 to 100. Now, in this case we uh, drew a crown outline blocked the affected area and then uh, figured out how much is the dieback. Next we looked at foliage transparency which gives us the absence of foliage where uh, foliage should normally have occurred and it is negatively correlated with tree health. So, if your crown does not have enough foliage, so in that case uh, it will appear transparent. So, all, all the light that is hitting the crown will be able to pass through and in that case your uh, tree will not be having enough amount of photosynthesis and so the amount, uh, so its uh, health will also be poor. Here also we define it in 5 percent classes and we use uh, our foliage transparency cards to determine the amount of foliage transparency. Next we also looked at uh, crown diameter. So, in the case of uh, crown diameter we can take two measurements and uh, with those two measurements we can keep both those diameters as the crown diameter values. Now, we looked at the importance of crown measures. So, they are an indicator of photosynthesis larger crowns will give us higher growth rates. Uh, they are useful in predicting responses to silvicultural treatments like thinning and fertilizer application. They are part of growth and yield models and the size is a surrogate for uh, or it is a proxy for photosynthetically active foliage. So, we also looked at crown width and the surface area and volume determination of a crown which is done uh, by considering our crown to be having a conical shape. So, these uh, the, the surface area and the volume are the equations of a cone. Next we looked at canopy cover and closure. So, we defined both of these terms. So, inside a forest the amount of light uh, can vary uh, depending on the amount of uh, canopy that is there. So, canopy will prevent light from reaching the bottom portions of the forest and we can measure light using a photometric or a radiometric measure 
and also by using uh, proxy measures such as canopy cover and closure. So, we looked at a demonstration of how we can use a photo resistor to measure the amount of light that is coming to a point. Then uh, we looked at canopy cover. So, canopy cover is uh, seen from the top. So, it looks at the projection of all the canopies if they are done on the ground. So, what proportion of the area is being covered by these projections will give us the canopy cover. Whereas, in the case of canopy closure, we take this bottom point and from that point, we take a reading from all the, the directions and the proportion of the points that are covered by the canopy or that C uh, canopy there will give us the canopy closure. So, in the case of canopy cover, it uh, varies with the height. Uh, in the case of canopy cover, uh, height is immaterial, but in the case of canopy closure, uh, height plays a very important role. So, canopy cover can be assessed by using a tube or by using remote sensing. So, we looked at these tubes. So, essentially they are periscopes that can give us what is seen on the top or we can use remote sensing to uh, for instance, we can use uh, uh, photography or even lidar to find out the areas that do not have a canopy. And in the case of canopy closure, we can use a densiometer or hemispherical photography. So, we looked at what a densiometer is and it has 96 points and those 96 points uh, can give us an estimate of the amount of canopy closure. So, all of these, so it, ha it is divided into 24 uh, grids, all these grids have 4 points and any point on which you can see a canopy is counted and then that value is divided by 96 and then converted into a percentage to give us the uh, canopy closure. Then we also saw this hemispherical photography which uses a fisheye lens or a very extreme wide angle lens. So, here we can see uh, what portion of the view is covered by the canopy and that can also give us the canopy closure. Next we looked at photogrammetry. So, photogrammetry is the is a form of remote sensing that utilizes the science and technology of obtaining spatial measurements and other geometrically reliable derived products from photographs. So, uh, the main principle of photogrammetry is that triangulation permits depth perception. So, essentially we are taking multiple images of an object and then we are using photogrammetry to convert it into a three dimensional information. So, photogrammetry is used for metric applications and interpretive applications. So, we can measure some parameters from a photograph or we can use uh, our photograph to interpret something meaning what is actually there in the photograph. So, for instance, in this picture, if we say that that it is showing us as canopies of different trees, so that is an interpretive uh, usage of photogrammetry. Whereas, if you use it to calculate the the crown uh, closure, then it will be a metric application. Then we looked at how do we take good photographs. So uh, we looked at uh, how field of view, focus, and exposure uh, determine what sort of photograph we'll get. We also looked at metric cameras in which all the parameters of the camera are very well defined. There are very low less distortions and a constant focal length. We also looked at stereometric cameras in which we have two metric cameras that are attached to the ends of a precisely measured bar to produce a stereo pair of images. Then we looked at variants of photogrammetry. So, these include aerial photogrammetry, terrestrial photogrammetry and, and industrial and scientific photogrammetry depending on where are we taking this pictures, whether we are taking it from the air, where whether we are taking it from the ground or whether we are uh, using it in an industrial or scientific fashion. Then we also looked at far range photogrammetry and close range photogrammetry. So, in the case of far range photogrammetry, the focus is at infinity. In the case of close range photogrammetry, the focus is at a finite distance. Then based on the orientation of the camera axis, we uh, define true vertical photogrammetry, near vertical and oblique photogrammetry. Now, in the case of oblique, we again uh, divide it into high oblique and low oblique. In the case of high oblique, we can see the horizon in all the photographs. In the case of low oblique, we uh, cannot see the horizon. So, we looked at differences between vertical and oblique photography, uh, photogrammetry and when do we use what. Then we saw that in the case of aerial photogrammetry, especially uh, the photographs that are taken have some amount of overlap between two pictures and this amount of overlap is then used for triangulating different distances. Uh, 
So, there are a number of corrections that are required. So, these corrections can these days be done automatically by using a number of different softwares. Then uh, we can take measurements by using this principle of, of stereo viewing. So, in all these photographs we have an overlap between the ends and an overlap between the sides and that can be used to, or to, to do the measurements. Then we also looked at the applications of aerial photo, uh, photography. So, it can be used to construct a number of different maps, uh, large scale or small scale where then we can use it to study hydrography of a location and we can also use it for exploration and recce purposes. Then there are some other products that come out of uh, this science of photogrammetry like digital elevation models or DEMS, orthophotos, thematic GIS data and other derived products and maps. Now, in the next section we looked at the basal area of a tree and a stand. So, we defined the basal area as the area that is occupied by the cross section of a tree trunk usually measured at the breast height and we use basal area to get an estimate of the stand density, the stand volume, the stand growth and for forest management purposes. So, why do we use basal area and not the number of trees? So, the number of trees or the number density is a very good indicator in case of plantations with very young trees, but as our trees grow further, so their diameter increases and the amount of, of space and the amount of nutrients that they require also increases. So, in later cases our number density is not that good a parameter as compared to the basal area density. So, next we saw how do we calculate the stand density or the number density. So, we count the number of trees per sample plot divided by the area of the sample plot to get the stand density or the number density. Then we looked at the calculation of the basal area of a tree. So, if you consider it to be having a, a circular cross section then you can use pi r square or pi d square by 4 and if you consider it to be having an elliptical cross section then you can go for pi a times b where a and b are the uh, half axis. So, next we looked at an example of finding a basal area. Now, in the case of a stand basal area, it is the sum of the basal areas of all the trees uh, that are there in a sample plot divided by the area of that sample plot and it is uh, represented in meter square per hectare. So, there are three methods of uh, calculating stand basal area. We can do a sum of the tree basal areas, we can use point sampling methods or we can go for a spacing factor method. So, we first looked at uh, this summation method. So, in which case we find out the, the basal areas for all the trees that are there in the area, then we add them up to get the this total basal area and then divide it by the area of the sample plot to get the basal area of trees per hectare. Next, we looked at the other two methods of calculating the stand basal area and also looked at crop diameter and crop age. So, in the case of spacing factor method, uh, the spacing factor is given by the average distance between two trees divided by this, the average stem diameter between two trees and we saw this theoretical construct in which the spacing factor is related to the basal area of the stand. So, if we know any spacing factor, we can figure out what is the basal area and if we have if we know the basal area then we can calculate the spacing factor. Now, spacing factor can be used. So, given our average tree diameter we can use the spacing factor to figure out what is the, the average distance between two trees. So, next we looked at this example in which we were uh, asked to compute the spacing factor and the basal area of the stand from the graph. So, it can also be used to calculate the amount of thinning that is required. And so, we looked at these examples. Next, we defined crop diameter. So, crop diameter uh, is used to calculate the volume of the crop and we use crop diameter or dq and we define it like this that the mean basal area of all the, the trees in the stand. So, uh, this mean basal area is the basal area of, of n number of trees divided by n. It is equal to pi by 4 into crop diameter square. So, Next, we were uh, we saw this example of how to calculate the mean diameter and the crop diameter and we saw that crop diameter is always greater than mean diameter. So, we also uh, computed how uh, we can prove this. Next, we looked at crop age which is the age of an even aged crop. So, in this case to find out a, a crop age, we take the basal area 
uh, and calculate the, the crop diameter. So, crop diameter is given by the, the mean basal area per tree is equal to pi by 4 d square. Then we, we plot an age versus diameter curve and we read the age corresponding to the crop diameter and that is called the crop age. So, that is not the mean age of the crop that is a different figure that we get out of the crop diameter. So, it is not from the mean diameter it is the crop diameter. So, that is something that you need to remember. Next we looked at point sampling. So, point sampling is a sampling uh, that goes by the name of PPS. So, it is probability proportional to size sampling. So, in this case uh, if we maintain a constant critical angle. So, we can use that critical angle to get the sum of the basal areas of, of trees and we can also use it to get the basal area of the stand by using the equation that uh, the that the basal area of the stand is equal to n times the basal area factor. Now, this basal area factor is computed from the critical angle. So, uh, there are two types of point sampling it can be done in a horizontal fashion to get the basal area or it can be done in a vertical fashion to get the height. So, in the case of horizontal point sampling uh, the trees are measured at breast height you can use any instrument you can uh, use specially constructed instruments or tubes or you can use even the end of a tape or you can use even a penny or you can use this instrument uh, that gives you three different basal areas or you can use the end of your thumb. And whenever you are using these instruments then any tree that subtends an angle that is greater than the critical angle is counted as a full tally. Any tree that subtends an angle that is less than the, the, the critical angle is not counted and any tree that subtends an angle that is equal to the critical angle is counted as a half tally. Then we also looked at uh, a wedge prism. So, a wedge prism results in a displacement of the tree. So, when we use it to, uh, to observe trees in a forest. So, we can see uh, some trees that are out. So, when they when they are completely out we do not tally them. If they are completely in then we call it a, a tally and when we have a borderline tree in which the right edge of this displaced tree is uh, meeting the left edge of the actual tree then we call it a borderline tree and we call it a half tally. So, there are a number of factors that affect accuracy in the case of PPS sampling. So, for instance, it is difficult in the case of dense stands, we need to correct for slope, we need to correct for leaning trees, uh, we need to ensure that, that there is no double counting when we are going all around 360 degrees and then if there are some headed trees then we need to go sideways. Now, these are the, the general rules for point sampling, uh, we choose a, a BAF such that the, the number of counts is between 10 to 12 and then the number of samples is also given. So, now the computations from point sampling. So, we can compute the number of trees per hectare by this equation. So, the number of trees per hectare is uh, the basal area factor that is given from the instrument itself multiplied by sum of the inverse of basal areas of the tally trees. Then we also have uh, we can also calculate the number of trees per hectare in each diameter class by uh, by multiplying uh, the number of tally trees with the basal area factor and dividing it by the basal area of the midpoint of the diameter class. Then we can also calculate the stand basal area per hectare as we have seen before it is n into B A F. So, next we use uh, next we saw some examples in which we were asked to compute the number of trees per hectare and the number of trees in each diameter class. So, that was given. Next, uh, we looked at the advantages and limitations of uh, point sampling. So, there is no need to fix any uh, uh, to lay any fixed area sample plot. So, it saves a lot of time. Plus, in the case of PPS sampling, the high value trees are sampled in greater numbers. So, uh, because high value trees are what we are we want to know more about. So, these are trees with larger diameters. So, these are those trees that can be extracted very easily from the from the forest. So, uh, that is another ad advantage there is no need to directly measure diameter for basal area per hectare and volume calculations and it is quick especially for reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance surveys. So, even if there is some amount of error or if there are some limitations even though even then we can use it for reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance surveys to get a quick figure. Now, we also looked at its uh, limitations, we cannot calculate sampling intensity, it is difficult to calculate plus it requires some skill plus it, it is difficult in the case of uh, heavy undergrowth in the case of tropical forest uh, 
and then because we only have a, a value between 10 to 12 so even a small error in tallying can get exaggerated and then we need to take care of slope hidden trees and so on then we looked at uh, the estimation of uh, number density so number density or the stand density is given by number of trees per area so there are a number of methods to do, to do it we can uh, use a sample plot method in which we lay out a sample plot of area a count the number of trees and then divide that figure by the area of the sample plot so we then looked at some examples next we saw this method in which we can find out this uh, distance between nearest trees and then we can use uh, the equation as the number of trees uh, per hectare is given by 4 by pi into 10000 by uh, li square and if we have uh, a number of measurements then we can take uh, the average of 1 by li square so then we looked at uh, some problems in which we use these equations and then another method is to uh, compute uh, distance not between the these uh, nearest neighbors but but between the nth nearest neighbors so in that case we say that the number density is n minus half into 10000 divided by m pi into the sum of 1 over k i square where k i is the the distance between the nth nearest neighbors so then we also looked at some examples then uh, next we looked at some other sample calculations so we looked at these methods again and then we looked at uh, this crown by bold diameter if that is given and if that is fixed then we can figure out the maximum feasible basal area of a stand per hectare uh, given certain kinds of spacings so for instance if you have a square spacing then the the number of trees per hectare uh, is given by 1 by k square into 10000 and the basal area of this stand is given by 10000 pi by 4 z square so this crown by by bold diameter is written as z so just by using this uh, figure you can calculate the basal area of the stand next we looked at some other examples of how to use the basal area factor Uh, in the next section we looked at volume calculations so volume calculations can be done through sections so uh, like in this example in which we have cut artery in standard sizes and then we take the measurements then next we looked at the volumes of uh, of different forms so in the case of a cylinder we use pi r square into h which can also be written as s into l then we looked at smolian's formula huber's formula and newton's formula for uh, for different solids and their frustums so newton's formula is considered to be the most accurate formula so in this case we uh, we multiply the length of the log by uh, with 1 by 6 of s1 and s2 so s1 and s2 are the end uh, surface areas or the end basal areas and four times of the middle uh, basal area so that is newton's formula in the case of a smallian formula we take two measurements of the of the two ends of the log uh, then take the average multiply that with the length and in the case of huber's formula we just take one measurement at the middle and we multiply that with the length and then we saw that in the in that in the case of uh, smallian and so newton's formula is used to calculate the errors in different other formulae so in the case of smallian's formula and in the case of huber's formula the errors are on opposite sides of zero now we also looked at the quarter girth formula in which uh, we uh, we assume that r so this is also known as the hoppus formula so in this case we assume that all th all these four d's will be lost out in sawing and uh, the volume of our log that remains will be equal to g by 4 as the edge so it is it will be g by 4 into g by 4 into the length of the log so next we saw that it is uh, around 78.54 percent of the actual volume of the cylinder now it approximates the volume of timber that is obtained after sawing so that is one utility of it then we also saw some some computations of how to use the quarter girth formula next we looked up uh, at volume computations in the field so one method is summing up the volumes of uh, different trees that we can use the next is the mean form height method so mean form height is given by sum of the volumes divided by sum of the basal areas of the trees and we can also use pooled mean form height uh, 
by taking uh, measurements from a number of sample plots and then we did this question in which uh, we we used both the the form height and the pool form height to get the volume density then we also looked at the regression method of computation of uh, the volumes so in this case we take the basal area and the volume and then we use it to uh, calculate a regression equation and that regression equation is then used to calculate the volume density of the stand next we looked at volume table so volume table is a table that shows volume of a given species for one or multiple dimensions so those dimensions can be diameter at breast height dbh and height dbh height and taper so taper can be given in the form of form factor and so on so there are a number of tables that are included in the volume table now depending on the number of variables we have three kinds of volume tables so we can have a single variable that is the dbh we can have two variables that is dbh and height for instance or we can have multiple uh, variables such as dbh height form uh, the form factor and so on then uh, depending on the scope of application we have general volume table regional volume table and local volume table we looked at their differences then depending on the outturn that is what we are trying to measure we can have standard round timber volume table commercial round timber volume table and so on then we looked at the the, the preparation of uh, general volume table and local volume table by graphical method and regression equation method so in the graphical method we select trees then we fell those trees we measure those trees plot the curves do some checks and balances and then use those to get the the general volume table and in the regression equation method we define some generalized regression equations and then we we use the the values of the trees that have been taken from the field to find out the uh, these uh, regression constants and from that regression constant we can then find out uh, your uh, your general volume equation and the uh, the this general volume table now in the case of preparation of local volume table we plot uh, uh, our gvt values of volume diameter and height and then uh, we take our readings from the field and then we draw a smooth curve to get the local volume table then we looked at its utility and limitations we also looked at forest sampling the dis the and we also saw difference between census and sampling so in the case of sen of census all the individuals in your population or all the units in the population are going to be measured whereas in the case of sampling we just take a small sample from the population take those measurements and then generalize them over the population so we looked at what is population sampling unit sampling frame sample sampling intensity and the kinds of plots so you can have plots of different shapes and sizes then we also looked at kinds of sampling so in the case of simple random sampling all the individuals in the population have an equal probability of uh, being a, a part of the sample in the case of uh, systematic sampling we take every nth unit in the sample in the case of stratified sampling we divide our population into a number of strata and then we take uh, samples from each strata in the case of multi stage sampling we define large units as large samples and then we we take sub samples from there and in the case of pps sampling that is similar to the uh, point sampling the probability of a unit getting into the sample is dependent on its size next we looked at the density and mass measurements so the basic equations are density is equal to mass by volume so why do we uh, need this uh, this density measurement because measuring the mass of large logs is difficult but measuring their volumes is very easy so if we know the density of logs then we can calculate the mass of the logs and mass of the logs can also be used to calculate the amount of sequestered carbon that is there in the logs or in the trees we looked at uh, archimedes principle so we get our sample using an increment borer now mass is very much dependent upon Uh, the amount of water content so we can take these measurements and then we can find out the moisture content in a sample of wood or to measure the volume we can either use uh, these equations of volume like length into breadth into height if we have a uh, this cuboidal sample or pi r square into h if we have a cylindrical sample and so on or else we can go for a water displacement method in which our sample is pushed inside uh, 
uh, a liquid with a needle and its uh, mass is measured or we can use xylometer that is uh, this device to measure uh, the volume of wood or we can directly measure density by using uh, the buoyancy laws and by, by balancing the forces. Next we also had a look at NDVI which stands for the normalized difference vegetation index. So, NDVI is a technique that measures the reflectance of different surfaces to get information about those surfaces. So, we looked at true color composites, the vegetation spectrum. So, in the case of vegetation spectrum, we can utilize this red edge to find out uh, vegetation and to differentiate it from different surfaces. Then we defined NDVI as NIR minus red divided by NIR plus red. So, in this true color composite, if we wanted to know whether this green color was because of vegetation or because of green colored tops of buildings that have been been, paint, been painted green, we can use uh, an FCC. So, in the case of an FCC, we will uh, display uh, infrared in the red band, then red in the green band and green in the blue band to get these images or we can use NDVI. So, in this case anything that is black does not have any vegetation and as it, uh, it uh, goes towards whitish values, so it has vegetation. Now, this index can be used to measure changes in plant phenology, uh, it can be used for vegetation and land use classification, biomass production, impact of grazing, maybe even impact of fire, amount of moisture in the soil, carbon sequestration potential of an area and so on. So, for instance, we can use it to differentiate different surfaces, differentiate between different kinds of vegetation, discerning the health of a plant and so on. Lastly, we also looked at site quality. So, in the case of site quality, we use this equation area plus environment gives us the type and quality of vegetation. So, there are a number of factors that affect uh, production of an area. So, for instance, rock, soil, climate, topography, vegetation and so on. And site quality measures the relative production capacity. So, uh, productivity is given as quality plus management input. So, if you keep all these management inputs as constant that is fertilizer, site treatment, irrigation, grazing, soil compaction, uh, growing stock manipulation and other management inputs. So, if they are constant, then this equation of site productivity is equal to site quality plus management input will give us that site quality is directly proportional to the site productivity. Now, we can measure site quality using two methods, one is the, the CVP index and the second is vegetative characteristics. So, in the case of CVP index, we define this index I is equal to T V by T A multiplied by P multiplied by G by 12 and multiplied by E by 100. So, that will give us an, a value and if that value is greater than 25, then we can have forest growth. Then we also looked at its limitations. Now, in the case of uh, vegetative characteristics, we can look at the species that are there on a site and we, we can also look at the characteristics of the tree in terms of uh, dbh breast uh, basal area uh, height volume and so on so for instance some species such as palash are an indicator of degraded forest so if those species are there then the site quality is not high and if you have two forest sites that are having the the same species then if uh, on one site the our trees have larger volumes then that uh, site is having a greater quality so we saw how uh, these factors can affect uh, the, the growth of trees and how in a standard way we, we use uh, diameter and height curves to find out the site quality. So, in the case of uh, site quality, we can use crop height method. So, in the case of crop height method, we get the top height and compare it with the yield table. And in the case of sample plot method, we plot diameter versus height curves and compare them with standard curves. So, like for instance, in this case, you have your uh, uh, your site quality curves for for four standard site qualities 1, 2, 3 and 4 plotted here and for your site of interest if you plot diameter versus height curve. So, any curve that it comes closest to gives you the site quality. So, that is all for revision. All the best for your exams. Thank you for your attention and Jai Hind. Do good.